So when my uh, father was about my age, he would uh, insist that something, that he could see something in front of him when he couldn't actually see it. So uh, I should really wear my glasses. And Uh, so I explained. Uh, am, am I, have I started yet? Anybody still have time? Okay, okay. So let me start. So I explained I have the curve C genus 5, and it's got uh, P0 plus G12 plus P infinity in half canonical class of C. <clears throat> and then I uh, uh, figure out some way of writing its equations like this. So uh, you know, the C is really, is really x1, and the D is really x2 squared. <coughs> right, but I want to write it like this. Right, so uh, the A and the, uh, the A and the B are something to do with taking F10 and writing him as... Uh, um, you know, F8, uh, so I don't know, T1 to the fourth or something. Uh, anyway, you don't need to, you don't, uh, so there is a little bit of fun here about making these equations work. Let me, but let me just think about the equations. So later on, setting, taking equations like this given in a general form and then setting C equals X1, that's part of my expression, regular pullback, right? So when I have a key variety, I want as many of these to be independent parameters as possible. And then if I want to apply them to a particular geometric situation, I will make substitutions like this. So there's a kind of format for equations here, and then I put uh, elements in a concrete ambient ring into them to make uh, the equations of a genuine variety. Okay, anyway, these are, um, this is y1 times x2, y2, z2, a, and Tom one matrix M equals lambda x one x two D Y two Z one Z two Z two minus B Y one Okay, so I hope, hope you can uh, read what I'm saying here. So I take these equations. I say, let me isolate the variable y1. So y1 is supposed to multiply x2, y2, z2, and a. Right? And then there are five other equations. So uh, these equations here have lambda equals zero at the, uh, when we start. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, you know, this, this little thing, x1, d, z1, x2, y2, z, is really, is really just a little block of this matrix, a block not involving y1, right? And then, uh, so there are these equations, there is also the equation x2 times ac and y2 times, and so on, z2 squared. So that's, this, that's the one I just said is this equation. There's two equations here involving x1, z2, and, and so on. Okay? And also, um, x2 times y1, d, z1, a, and tom2 matrix, so now, 
is not going to M. It's M1, M2 equals lambda C y1 d z1 c x1 y2 z2 z1 minus bd and then sorry if you can't read this at the bottom it's a Anyway, if you can't read it, it's a useful exercise to figure out these matrices yourself. Okay, so the thing I'm saying here is uh, also the variable x2 here hits y1, d, z1, and uh, a, c, right? And I can just ignore the term a there and think of them as sitting a, right? And if I do that, then I get the this, uh, it, so... I take x2 appears linearly in four equations with those, those guys, and then he also appears in uh, and then uh, the equations not involving the x1, the x2. You know? And so, you know, this is, a, this is a, a happy set of equations. Right? I've got, this one is a TOM1 with the, uh, these, these six entries being more or less this ideal. This one here is a Tom two. So if you ignore, if you erase that, the the six entries you get there are just about this ideal. Yes. So if I, I kill this second row of the matrix, I've got y one d z one, z one minus b d a. Right. So the two coincidences here are this z one, this z one, this d, and this d. Right. So this guy has five Fafians. This guy has five Pfaffians, and they overlap in two equations. Right? You can think about, if you can think about this, this equation y2z1 is common to these, to these two equations. And there's another one somewhere. Uh, this is z2, no, z1. Uh, anyway. y2z1 and z1, z2. Right. So, so both of these equations have z1, z2 in them, and both of them have y1, z2 in them. <clears throat> right, and then there's a ninth equation. Uh, is um, x2, y1, is cx1 squared. Lambda squared bc. Yeah, so... All of these equations, uh, these, uh, all of this material here, makes perfectly good sense when lambda is zero. So if you take the equations I started with here, then they are, th they are just these equations here with lambda equals zero, including this ninth. Yes? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's harmless enough. And then I say the variable lambda here is of degree zero, so I can... So the, the, there's an entry zero in the matrix. It's not just zero as written, but he's also of degree zero. So I can try to change him for a variable lambda, with lambda not zero. Right? And it so happens that yeah, I need to do the same here. This is in the two entry of the matrix, the row two of the matrix, which is free. Right? And so it so happens that these give a flat deformation of the, uh, of the original equations. And when lambda's not zero, then the, uh, the base point uh, p, p naught moves. Right. So when lambda's not equal to zero, then uh, you can, we can eliminate... Uh, Z2 from this equation, and we, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure what. Uh, so when lambda not equal to zero eliminates variable Z2 as generator, and you get um,
so, so, I, so then I get C, C primed, so I get C, C prime lambda contained in P of 1, 1, 2, 2, only 1, 3, third dimension 3. And these are 5 by 5 Fafian, uh, and that's an exercise. <coughs> okay, so if lambda's not zero, remember, remember whenever you write down these 5, five by 5 matrices, then there are five equations there that are the Fafians, and there are also five zizages. So the, the five rows of this matrix are five linear, uh, uh, five identities, linear identities holding between the zizages. And that means that actually if one of these lambda is not zero, you lose some of the equations. So some of the equations are, those zizages say that some of those equations are unnecessary. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not doing this in detail. So now, uh, uh, you know, I can make uh, lambda, la I can make P infinity move on a curve, on a curve P, on a curve C mu by a similar calculation. Right. Uh, so I'm not going to write it down because it's just another black book full of exactly the same kind of equations. It's, uh, it will be written down in the little paper that's coming out of this. And then, um, and then you know, this is a sort of remarkable thing. Uh, I only know how to do it in, uh, by some kind of, at the moment, by some kind of algebra. So write down... lambda equations and the mu equations together in one family, parametrized by a2 lambda mu. Right. So let me, let me just start writing down the equations. Uh, so uh, I'm going to write down I'm only going to write down four of these equations this defining uh, so I'm writing down x1 y2 equals d x2 squared so eventually this d will be d times x2 so again this is a pullback thing now I'm not, I'm not explaining it properly, plus lambda z2 plus mu squared ad, and then x2 y1 equals c x1 squared plus lambda squared bc plus mu z2 z1. So uh, I'm not writing down all the equations. I'm just writing down the ones I particularly like. Uh, X1, Z2 equals X2, Z1 uh, plus, so minus mu B, Y2 plus mu A, Y1. And then the last, uh, the last I'm going to write down is Z1, Z2 equals AC, X1, Y1 plus BD, X1. I'm sorry, this is a plus. Plus BD, X2, Y2 minus lambda mu. So let me, let me just make a couple of comments about these equations before I sort of try and state what I, where I'm going. <clears throat> so by, doing, by, by writing down the Fafians of this matrix and this ninth equation, I've got a set of nine equations with a single parameter lambda. Right? And then there's a way of doing the same thing with a similar parameter in mu. 
So the lambda squared appeared, for example, here. The lambda squared is going to the lambda squared is appearing in one or two places. There's one term here with lambda squared and one term with mu squared. Right? And what I'm doing is I'm just taking all the equations with the lambda, <coughs> making some kind of little change of coordinates here for, so that the tokenization I did there is compatible in the two cases. And I'm just writing them down together. And then uh, this term here, if I don't write this extra term lambda mu a, b, c, d, then you don't get a flat deformation. A little bit of computer algebra there. Okay? So you notice here I've got, if lambda is not zero, or if mu is not zero, then I'm getting rid of one of the coordinates. So, uh, so this is four equations in a pile of variables. So, uh, you know, A. And then it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I really don't know. It's sort of x1, x2, y1, y2, a, b, c, d, uh, lambda mu. Yes? So I'm really thinking of the lambda mu as being deformation parameters. Equals zero. Okay, so, uh, you know, if I sort of, uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is 8 plus 2, and this is 2. <coughs> right? And so I'm writing down four equations there, and then I say, and uh, colon out, and colon ideal with uh, x1, x2, y1, y2, z1, z2. Right. So you notice uh, these matrices give you lots of zizages saying x2 times one of the equations plus is or the linear combination of the other equations. So uh, I'm writing down four equations here that define a co-dimension four variety in there. If I take the scheme defined by these four equations, it's reducible, and I'm only interested in one substantial irreducible component of it. So in computer algebra, what I say is completely adequate to define a codimension. So it's, it so happens that this is, uh, this is codimension four, is codimension four Berenstein. Right? And if I specialize, I can get uh, a two-parameter two family of curves. Uh, lambda mu. So, you know, remember, so, so here, the thing I'm really talking about is M5, and inside M5 here, I've got these uh, G13 plus a point in half K, and G1, G13 plus P infinity in a half K, and here I've got uh, uh, here I've got uh, G12 plus P0 plus infinity, P infinity. So again, with these, now saying that these are in half K is the same thing as saying that these two guys are, are very nice. So this is a slice of the hyperelliptic locus. I start off with a single hyperelliptic curve, and I found a two-parameter deformation of it that allows me to move this. Right, and uh, so... Extending this to surfaces uh, is, uh, uh, you know, Horikawa and Dix, and uh, it's quite tricky. Right? So, um, um, you know, the, the picture I drew on the blackboard there is the modular space of curves, so you expect that to be nice and unobstructed. So this is the modular space of curves of genus 5. As you know, it's, uh, you know, dimension 12 and uh, non-singular. And then inside here, there's the, uh, there's the hyperelliptic locus, which is in codimension 2, and this G13 locus, which is in codimension uh, uh, 1. <coughs> and, uh, you know, this is the picture you get. Uh, and so, you know, this is as nice as you could possibly have. 
I have these two base points to a linear system, and I can move, I can allow either of them to move away freely in a one-parameter family, or I can do them both at the same time in a two-parameter family. So uh, in the surface case, uh, this is not the case. In the surface case, if I take the general surface with these properties, which I haven't written down here, but uh, uh, you know, Dix's thesis writes down, uh, uh, then uh, we believe that the general surface with uh, two, two, two base points is, um, does not deform to in this way. So you have two base points there, and for the surface, either you lose both of these points in the deformation family, or you lose neither of them. So the surface, the surface, uh, the moduli, moduli space of surfaces is obstructed, and there's a kind of slice across there. Anyway, I'm not. I'm going to stop this now because it's uh, it's difficult and it's uh, it's um, uh, well, it's stuff that I'm still working try, trying to understand. And in any case, it would be difficult, so it would be complicated equations. Okay, so that's the end of the first lecture. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, these uh, big... Uh, uh, so now I'm going to talk about parallel unprojections. Right. And so parallel means that I have x and I have d1 and d2 in, in it. So this is, uh, I can, uh, so hypotheses of the uh, Kristen Miller on projection. Uh, for both, uh, uh, for both d1 and x and d2 and x. Right. So, uh, in this case, if I take the equations y2, z1, and z1, z2, the things that are common to both of these, I can, if I, I can, if I projected out the x2 in these equations, I'd have two equations not involving x2, and if I project out the y2 here, I'd have two equations project not involving y2, right? And so I can think of this as I start off with a variety uh, which is co-dimension 2 and contains two of these hypersurfaces, and then I could uh, blow up, I could unproject either of them separately and get these varieties, or I can do the whole thing and I get this co-dimension 4 variety. Right, and then uh, can get um, both can do both on projections at one time. So, so let me do let me do a very very simple case of this, and then uh, and then go on and say the things that you can do using the same, uh, the same kind of idea. So the simplest would be, e.g., I've got, suppose I've got x1, y1 as a regular sequence. And so, you know, I want, this can be a regular sequence in any, in a key variety, uh, but let, let's, just to be, to be concrete, let's, uh, let's say this is in Pn. And let me just take these to be coordinates. And then x2, y2 to be a regular sequence. Right? So if you want, just think of P3 with coordinates x1, x2, y1, y2. Right? And so when I, when I write this, these, the whole the set of four elements is a regular sequence of length four. Right now, now suppose I take a hypersurface V. Uh, I'm going to take a hypersurface X that is contained in the ideal, ideal product ideal, uh, X1 X2 X1 Y1 intersect X2 Y2. 
Right? So this might be, uh, you know, in this P3, I've got two lines, x1 equals y1 equals 0, x2 equals y2 equals 0, and then I've got some hypersurface that contains both of them. Right? Now, under this condition that the concatenated, the sequence of four guys is a regular sequence, it so happens that this intersection of ideals is the same thing as the product of the ideals. So this is x1, x2, x1, y2, x2, y1, x2, sorry, what do I mean, y1, y1, x2, uh, y1, y2. Yes. So, uh, so the thing I'm really saying here is let, let V, let X be given by equation A times X1, X2 plus B times X1, Y2 plus C times Y1, X2 plus B times Y1, Y2. Yes. And then, uh, so what's the end projection? So I'm going to introduce a variable... So, sorry, let me, let me go across the blackboard this way. So, so I, hope, I hope you can see here, X contains D1, and D1 is given by X1, Y1. So this means that the equation of X is in... Is the equation of x is of the form a times x1 plus b times y1 equals 0. Right? So, so that's, I'm just using temporary notation. Take these, take these terms here and somehow to sort them out into guys divisible by x1 and guys divisible by y1. Right? And then so I'm going to write s1 is equal to, uh, so what do I want to write? A over y1 equals minus b over x1. Yeah, and so this is, I haven't told you what degree the x is going to be. For example, if the x has got degree, uh, let's take x as degree d, then these a, b, c, d are degree, okay, okay, that's not good, is it? Uh, if x is of degree, uh, um, nice letter of the alphabet. Uh, um, delta. delta. Okay, so there, these are of degree delta minus 2, and the, uh, the a and the b are of degree delta minus 1, so this guy's here are of degree delta minus 2. Okay, so now, so then the un unprojection, concretely speaking, the un unprojection is S1, X1 uh, equals minus B, S1, Y1 equals A, and it, this is contained in P of 1, 1, 1, 1, and then uh, uh, delta minus 2. Yeah? <coughs> And uh, at some point, I'm going to need who these A and B are, right? But anyway, I can, then I can write S2. So, you know, also X contains D2. And so I can, so there'll be a non-projection variable S2. So, so, you know, this S1 here is intrinsically, S1 is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, complementary basis element to HOM, I D1 in omega x. Right? This is a, an intrinsic statement of who, who the S1 is. <coughs> so he's got poles exactly on D1. That means if I take the S1 and I multiply by the, the generators of the ideal D1, I get something regular. And here I'm, the, these delta minus 2 is twisting here is just to say this is intrinsically a canonical form on, uh, on x1. So then there's going to be s2x2 is minus uh, b, you know, primed or something, 
plus 1x uh, plus 2, y2 equals a prime. Right? And what have I done? I say I can unproject, I can unproject d1 to something of codimension 2 in here, and I can unproject d2 to something of codimension 2 in a similar space. Right? However, if I want to uh, unproject both of them at the same time, I must also need an equation S1, S2. Yeah? Equals what? Yes? And so, you know, the, the X was a hypersurface. And this first unprojection is codimension 2. So this guy here will be codimension 3. Right? And what do we know about codimension 3 varieties? Well, they're always given by Pfaffians and usually 5 by 5 Pfaffians. And so isn't it lucky? I've got exactly five equations here. And uh, so I'm going to be able to figure out what this right-hand side is by playing with Pfaffians. Right? So at this point, I need to know who A and B are. So A was all the stuff divisible by... I'm taking this equation here, and I'm taking all the stuff divisible by x1. So A is ax2 plus by2. So I've got s1, y1 equals... I'm sorry, I should have uh, prepared this one. This is ax2 plus by2. And uh, S2 is, S1, X1 is minus. So where are we? Uh, B is all the stuff divisible by Y1. So it's the CX2 plus DY2. And then some, exactly the same way, S1, X2 equals, so S2, X2. Right, so this is B primed, and B primed is all the stuff divisible by Y2. Which is um, BX1 plus DY1. And then S2, X, uh, Y2. Okay, so has anybody, can anybody guess what this should be? Anybody get, any get, make any guesses? So, uh, you know, I mean, it's sort of obvious. There's only one thing it, can, it could possibly be, and that is AD minus BC. Yes? So, you know, we'll follow by these equations by messing around, by eliminating variables, by playing with visages, or by taking colon ideals, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so it's a little exercise. Figure out how to put these into a 5 by 5 Pfaffian. Yeah? How to make those five equations into the five Pfaffians of a skew-symmetric matrix. It's a very easy exercise. You know, if you can't do the baby case, you won't be able to do the harder cases. Okay? So, so look, uh, what I'm saying here is, suppose X is a hypersurface, and suppose it contains two, uh, you know, linearly disjoint, as disjoint as possible, uh, codimension uh, divisors. Right? This might be a cubic surface containing two lines, for example. Perfectly good uh, example of that. Right? Then I can contract one of them to make something codimension 2. I can contract the other one also to make something codimension 2. Or I can contract both of them. I can do this on projection to both of them, and I get something in codimension 3. My calculation is completely automatic. Right. So I want to use this for... Um, I want to explain how other people... Have really, three very nice... Uh, pieces of work in the recent literature which use this, uh, use the, the, this idea. And so there's, um, let me start with, um, so there's something, there's a paper by Nevsh, 
and Papadakis They say, take uh, uh, take P seven. Well, uh, so, so let me let me let me let me say what the answer is before I say how they calculate it. So we want a surface of general type with P G equals five. K squared equals 12. Yeah, so uh, when you see these numbers in this context, the, the, what you have to write is this is 4PG minus 12 plus 8. So they want to find this surface uh, uh, S. And there's a kind of, uh, you know, um, guess Four PG minus twelve. Four PG minus twelve is a magic number. Four PG minus four altogether is sixteen. Four PG minus twelve plus four. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so guess. Try S is in V. Fano threefold, a Q Fano threefold, with S in minus two K V. Okay, so I'm not going to justify the guess. I'm not going to say why this is a good guess. Uh, it, it works in that case. Right? So what do we know about V? So V is Fano threefold. So uh, minus KV is ample. And uh, it has a Hilbert series. Right? So the Hilbert series for the surface we know is 1 plus 2T uh, plus uh, K squared minus plus this number 4T squared plus 2T cubed plus T. So the force of one minus t all cubed, right? Uh, so if you think about this, the numbers on top add up to exactly the wrong number. Uh, what have I done wrong? Uh, that should be three, G, three pg minus seven. Uh, I'm sorry. These numbers have to add up to twelve. One, two, six. I'm sorry, I should have possibly prepared this a little bit better. Right? And so the Hilbert series of the Fano threefold has essentially the same. The Hilbert series, Hilbert series equals the same divided by 1 minus t squared. Yes. Sorry, so, the general type surface is just that part. Hilbert series of S. <coughs> so, so you know, this is one plus P G minus three T plus K squared minus T P G plus four T squared plus. Does that make it better? Twelve minus ten plus four is six. So look, you've, uh, you've all heard me lecturing about surfaces of general type, and I must have written down this formula many times. Right? You've also heard me lecturing about Fano threefolds, and this, the same. So uh, the surface is obtained. If, if, I, if I can make the Fano threefold, at the end we will be able to make it. So if we can make it, then the S is just a hyperplane section in the given polarization of the V. Right? So I get the Hilbert series of 1 by multiplying 
by this 1 minus t squared corresponding to taking a section of degree 2. Right? And so this is uh, from Fano threefolds. This says that uh, um, a V has a genus equals something, genus equals 3, and uh, k squared equals, um, I'm sorry, and um, basket 4 times a half. Okay, so, so at the end, I'm going to have V containing S, right? So the ring of V, the ring of S is obtained from the ring of V by dividing out by a regular element of degree 2, right? So in degree 1, nothing changes. So the H0 of minus KV is equal to H0 of KS, is equal to 5. So the genus is uh, defined so that the genus plus 2 is equal to this number. Right? And then this 4 here is this number of uh, singularities, uh, orbifold points. Yeah? So, so let me say, therefore, what do we have to do to find V? So if V exists, it should be it should be v in p one to the fifth. That's the, for the pg, and then two to the fourth. <coughs> right. This is supposed to be a threefold. Right. And then he's going to be in this nine-dimensional space, so we have co-dimension six. So here. In this, this space has this, uh, you know, this, this whole space is a kind of cone, and then it has this uh, P3 of, P, uh, uh, it looks like, P, it has uh, the sub-variety P3 here, and then with transverse, transverse one-half of uh, one, 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 one. I got that right? So this is a P8 and co-dimension 5. Right. It's a threefold, and so this is a, there's a P3 in there, and a, a transverse to the P3, there's this uh, five direction. Yes? So, um, uh, you know, uh, Stavros is not as sophisticated as that. This is a simple construction. This is, you know, we only, know, we only have one method to play with, which is a projection. Of course, this is studied by Takagi. <coughs> right? And so the thing that uh, the thing that Stavros and uh, that uh, Stavros and Georges say is that uh, you know so my V here is going to intersect this P3 you know complementary dimension or something it's got to intersect the P3 and uh, it will intersect it in four times a half of one 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 oh. Yeah. So uh, out there, at some place in the way to project space, there's this locus of orbifold points, and the V is going to meet it, and it's going to meet it at these four points. And so we can project from any, project from each of these. Right. And so the guess is, let's start off with V four in P. Let's start off from W4 in P1 to the 8th, right? And I'm thinking of these guys as being lined up, X1, Y1, 
x2, y2, and so on, x4, y4. Eight parameters. And I want to take this w here to be in, the equation of w is going to be in the product of the four ideals, xi, yi. Yes, does this make sense? So, so I, I take a projective space with coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4. It's a P7, right? So I say, let's look at products of these four ideals. Right. So uh, a this is a particular way of getting something in the intersection of these four ideals. It's just the simplest way of getting something in the intersection of the four ideals, right? And so if I take, uh, so this thing contains things like x1, x2, x3, x4, and x1, x2, x3, y4, and uh, 16 other guys. Yeah, so I just take a general linear combination of these 16 terms. Right? That's the equation of a hypersurface containing this. Right? And the, 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 the parallel and projection says, so parallel and projection says I can introduce four variables, SI, right? And uh, we can calculate the variables of degree SI la later, but in fact they'll be of degree 2. And equations SI, XI, SI, YI, and also SI, SJ, Right, so I'm, I'm writing down completely definite equations, right? So I take this expression here. This is a, I take this equation of W4. He's a linear combination of these 16 terms with generic coefficients, right? And then if I want to know what S1, X1 is going to do, I do exactly what I did here, right? I write him as A times X1 plus B times Y1, and then I think of A is all the terms which multiply x1 there, and then I write s1 is a over y1. Yeah? And then I have to write si, sj, and that's going to be a little 2 by 2 determinant exactly as here. Right? In any case, whether you believe my calculations or not, there is the Christian Miller unprojection theorem that says I can do this. Right? And so this gives this variety w bar inside p weighted projective space. Now it's 1 to the eighth and two to the fourth. And he has, uh, he has this guy as his section. So if I take, uh, take intersection uh, um, so h1, h2, h3. So this guy was seven, this guy was six dimensional. And then I I take, I'm going to, this guy is six dimensional, as befits a key variety, and I'm going to take H1 insect, H2 insect, H3 insect Q, and this gives me my surface S. Surface S from one. Right? So this is a very, this is actually a very simple minded uh, procedure. Right? We're not analyzing all possible ways of making finer varieties with these singularities, as uh, Takagi did. Right? We're just saying we have one method, easy, easy method at hand, which is this parallel on projection. And uh, so by doing this, I can make a variety here. We know all, all about how to calculate these uh, you know, changes in the Hilbert series going, uh, by, uh, arising from the on projection. And then I take, the, uh, you know, we know how to calculate. So the canonical class of this, this is a, 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 a hypersurface to degree 4 in this 1 to the 8. So the hyperplane section of it is 
uh, the canonical class of W is O of minus 4. Right? This is minus 8 plus 4. Right? And then each of these, each of these PIs, each of these uh, devices, DI here, is P5, and so has K equals O of minus 6. So the unprojection device has degree two, as I said. Yeah? And, that, you know, you just calculate everything, you get this. So Georges and uh, the, the reason that they wanted this is uh, they, can, they use this to make a Campadelli surface with, to make, so, so Nev use this. Plus Z mod six group action to get Campadelli with um, uh, pi one Z mod six. Right, and so you know, I mean, obviously, you have to do a little bit of uh, group theory at the end. Uh, so, uh, so you notice here, in order to make this construction run, then I need this W to contain these devices, and I really want these devices to be, well, uh, you know, you can't expect them to be disjoint, but you don't want them to be, you know, you want, you want at least that any four of these form a regular sequence. So I want them. I want the. I don't want the DIs to intersect in in uh, in co-dimension one. Right. On the other hand, there's absolutely no reason to only consider this product of the ideals. The thing I want is the intersection of the ideals. So the pro taking products of the ideals is just a, an easy, a cheap way of making sure that I'm, I'm in the intersection of the ideals. And so, you know, if people want to apply this to give other constructions, they might try cleverer ways of doing this. Okay, so I'm going to give another, an, another, another example. L let, me, let me try and be brief about it so that I can say something about Sohel's thesis. <coughs> so there's a, there's a recent paper on Archive by uh, Nevsh, George Nevsch and, uh, and um, Roberto Pignatelli, so they want to construct a surface with PG equals seven. So it's sort of basically the same kind of setup, although it'll, the end, at the end it'll be something slightly different with k squared equals uh, 24. Right, and as you notice, this is 4pg minus 12 plus 8. So we make basically the same guess. So we assume that S, we assume that S is in minus 2 kV on Q fun V. So then V will be contained. So I'm not going through the same calculation, but it's a completely automatic procedure with Hilbert series. Uh, V will be contained in P of 1 to the 7th, that's that 7, 2 to the 8th, that's that 8, and it'll have degree 12, right, there's that, that's that divided by that, and it'll have 8 times 1 half of 111 points. Right, this is a threefold.
right? Now, uh, this, this is uh, an, an unprojection of eight planes on V primed, which is 2, 2, 2 in P to the 7th, in P 6. Okay, so the problem here, the prob th their problem here is, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're just doing this numerical guesswork. Yeah, so if, if this exists, then the V has predictable number of uh, uh, baskets, predictable basket of half points, right? And the Hilbert series and the graded ring has a predictable number of generators, right? So if you can make this, then you should be able to project out each of these eight variables independently and get back down to something in, one to the, in P1 to the seventh, which is this, right? And the thing we want is to be a simple Fano variety, Fano variety of index one. Right? So this is uh, minus 7 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is one, minus 1. Right? So, you know, is it possible to find V primed here containing eight planes? Right? So I want eight planes and they can intersect like that, but they're not allowed to intersect in co-dimension 1. And so here the calculation is a bit different because if I take one of these planes and I am projected, I'm going to co-dimension 4 and I'm going to this variety not with a 9 by 16 on projection but with a... Well, anyway, I'm going to cut the story short. So, uh, you know, they carry all of this out. Right? Uh, so... In fact, this is, you know, in some ways this is a bit of a cheat because they start off with a good, uh, and they start off with a kind of general statement of the problem and general guesswork, but at the end what they get is take P1 cross P1. So, you know, here, here's a little sort of feature. Here's a little thing you should uh, think when you see a Fano threefold. If a Fano threefold has got a lot of these half points, then... Maybe it's a Enriquez Fano variety. Maybe it has a double cover ramified in these eight points. And this one turns out to be like this. So in fact, they get, they get V and S quite cheaply. As by doing, by doing, so, so this is, you know, this was the statement of the problem. This was what they want to get. Now I'm going to tell you how they get it. So what they do is they do P1 cross P1 cross P1 cross P1, four copies. So then they take the segre embedding of this, right? So, uh, you know, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So this guy would be in, P, in P15. Yeah. And so what they're going to do is take this and they're going to divide it out by the group Z mod 2. So, you know, uh, one objection here is that this is four-dimensional, whereas we're only looking for a threefold. Right, let me come to that. So I'm going to divide this out by Z2. And the Z2 is acting by, uh, you know, XY goes to X minus Y on each of these four copies. Right? So it's dividing the 16 coordinates here into eight positive and, and eight negative ones. Yeah, that's an easy, this is an easy, this, all this is very easy. Yes, and now, now I'm going to take hyperplane, hyperplane of degree, of multi-degree, two, of multi-degree, one, 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 and I'm going to take X, X, X1, X2, X3, X4 equals Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. Right? 
So this is linear. This is linear in each of the four sets of variables. Yeah, this one's got x1, y1. So, so these are linear, and uh, you know they have the same class under z, z mod 2. I'm not saying it in detail, but this is very easy, right? And this is v3. So this, uh, you know, there are 16 coordinate points here. But uh, this, this hypersurface passes through eight of them. So this is V. And S is V intersect a bit more. Intersect to 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Yes? So anyway, let me just get to the punchline. They succeed in doing this. And by doing this, uh, then they... Then they have to find, you know, they haven't, you know, they, the Levshin Papadakis thing, they were, they wanted to construct this Campadelli with Z mod 6. So what are these guys trying to do? Well, they, they take this S and be given uh, uh, an action of Q8. So this is the quaternion group. So this is, uh, you know, plus or minus 1, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. Right? And then uh, when you do uh, the quotient S divided by Q8, this is, uh, this is uh, surface with pg equals 0, k squared equals 3. Right. And it is, the, this is their punchline, this is their big result. This is the, uh, uh, this is full moduli, and it contains the tertiary vernier surface. Okay. So, uh, I think everybody has heard Ingrid or uh, the other guys lecturing about tertiary Bernier surfaces. So, you know, there's a kind of picture like this, which is Bernier surfaces. No, oh dear, I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, yeah, sorry. Yes? So I, I do, do this picture that makes Bernier surfaces, and I have three coincidences here, forming a triangle, forming a little triangle. There. Anyway, uh, you can you can make this construction, but if you make this, you'll find that this only depends on one moduli, whereas these surfaces should de depend on four moduli. And uh, uh, Nevsh and Pignatelli make this uh, construction. So you know the point is really that uh, uh, so. You know, I said, I make this surface like this, and I've already divided it by Z mod 2. So that implies that the surface S here, the surface S I make in this way, will not be simply connected. So in fact, uh, pi 1 of this is pi 1 of the Bernier is Z2 cross Q8. Right, and uh, in fact, he has even more symmetry than that. So if I go up to the universal covering, he has a, a, a bigger group of symmetry, which includes the fourfold cover of the plane ramified here. Anyway, this is an extremely elegant construction, right? You start off by saying what you want to do, and then, you know, you use the intuition you get from looking at this unprojection thing, and you say, well, actually, I'm going to go, go around it some other way. So they can they they find this variety they find this model by doing the uh, parallel on projection exactly as here. So let me uh, briefly say uh, Sahel's thesis. So uh, as everybody remember, Sahel was 
in Korea on two occasions, supported by the WCU program. Uh, <coughs> he, uh, so, Sohail Iqbal. So this is uh, my 2011 Warwick PhD thesis. I should say submitted. <coughs> um, submitted last week. So uh, uh, the thing he's doing is especially, he's doing several things, but especially uh, we're going to do Zmod for Godo. surfaces contain a conic, which is a minus four curve. Right? So, so here's this uh, here's this surface S. So it's a surface with PG equals zero, K squared equals one, uh, pi one equals seven one four. And he contains this conic. And we're going to take this to a, a singular surface, S bar here, containing a quarter of one one singularity, this con contract. Right, and then he's going to, to do the S, S bar, and he's going to deform it out to, uh, so S T, uh, maybe I call it T, right, deformation. Thank you. Right. So this is a this is a Q Gorenstein smooth. Right. And this 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 will be the TT will be a, a Campodelli. And he can have uh, pi one is Z mod eight or Z mod two plus Z mod four. So in the cases, in all the cases you consider, this C here, the curve C, is in two pick S. So it's divisible by two in pick S. And so the fundamental group jumps up. So uh, we don't know whether it's possible. We don't know whether it's possible to do this. Uh, can we do uh, uh, pi one of T? Z mod 4 by the same method. So, you know, so Hell's been very busy right, finishing the thesis and so on, and he wanted to do this at the same time, and maybe he will be able to at some point, but uh, that's all in the future. And at the same time, he can also do Z mod 5 Godot, uh, contains, a, contains a chronic and deforms to um, Z mod 5 Campodelli. And you know, in, in, this, in this connection, so, so you know, here we're seeing this PG equals 0, K squared equals 3, and pi one is uh, Z two cross Q eight, right? And so uh, it's possible that you can take uh, uh, Campadelli with uh, pi one of order eight, right? And there are uh, there are. Uh, four separate families of these guys can be made to contain a, a conic to give uh, these uh, immortality surfaces.
So there are two aspects to this, and uh, you know, he does, he does two different things. He does two quite different things in opposite directions. So if we can construct a Campanelli with pi, uh, if we can construct a Campanelli with pi mod 8, then uh, somewhere there, there is this variety, Q1 in set Q2 in set Q3 in set Q4 in P7 with a group action here of order 8. Yeah, and so this would be, uh, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure, T universal color. So let's sort of uh, not worry too much about the whole group of order 8 here, but let's just take a Z mod 2 contained in there. Right? And let's suppose that when he acts on this uh, P7, he acts by plus, 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 and then minus, 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 minus. Right? And so... Uh, you know, uh, if I take Z2 acting on this P7 by plus, 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 minus, 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 then I get uh, a variety like this, Fano variety of index uh, minus 8, right? And he's got a, a P2 plus there of uh, one half of, this is a sixfold, one half of one, 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 one. And then he's got, over here, he's got a P3 minus of, uh, with normal bundle, a half of one one one. Oh, I see, that P7 is a P1 to the second. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, this is, uh, uh, have I got this right? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, there's seven parameters there. The three of them are in the P2 plus direction. Four, three, four of them are in the P3 minus. So there are three parameters sticking out of there and four parameters sticking out of there. Yes? So, uh, you know, this is a very interesting... Uh, this is a, a variety that has sort of various interesting in interpretations. So uh, what I want to do is take, uh, so, you know, call these x1, x2, x3, and then y1 up to y4. Right? So when I'm writing this, I've chosen not just the group action on P6, but a linearization of it to the action on the homogeneous coordinate. That's not a completely trivial thing. I could have chosen minus, 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 plus, 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 and then I would get a different story. Right? So I want to say that this quotient, P6, I, you know, what I really want to do is, is think of this as a key variety. So the advantage of doing this is basically I can forget about these quadrics. Right? So this T twiddles... I can arrange for this, uh, this is in section of four quadrics, so I can easily arrange for it to completely miss this P3. Or I can arrange for it to hit the P3 in one point or two points or three points or four points or five points or six points or eight points. Right? Uh, so that's complicated properties of these Quadrics, and if I start working with complicated products of quadrics, at some point I have to prove non-singularity, and usually that's completely poisonous. So I, I, let's work with the key variety instead. So I want this to take this to be proj of the ring, uh, you know, this is x1, x2, x3, and y1, y2, y3, y4, invariant under the group z mod 2. Right. So this, is, this variety here has torsion in his Picard group, and so I can write him as a proj in several different ways. 
right? And I've chosen this linearization, right? So, you know, what's happening here? Well, this is x1, x2, x3. These are just linear variables. Degree 1. And then the yi's, well, the yi's are not invariant under the group, so what I have to do is take S2 of the yi's, right? And they, can, they come in a matrix, namely they're V0, uh, okay, 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 V11 equals y1 squared, and V12 equals y1, y2, and so on, right? And the way to write these is, of course, as a... a, as a standing out of the way of the blackboard is V11, V12, V13, V14, V44, symmetric matrix. Right? So what am I writing here? The thing I'm writing here is the second Veronese cone of P3. Right? So let's do second Veronese cone of P3 contained in P of these 10 YIs. Yeah, so this is a P9. Right, and it's really P9, it's really 222. <clears throat> yes, and so uh, this, uh, this whole key variety here is a cone over this. So the, ho the whole key variety is P2 in X1, X2, X3, coned onto this, right? And so, you know, for a lot of purposes, we can just forget this. So what I want to do is take this Veronese cone and make a cascade of projections from it. Oh, sorry. So I do this V2 of P3. Right. Let, let me call him, uh, for example, V8, sitting inside weight, uh, projective space P9. Right. And I want to do P1 up to Pk general points. Right. And then I want to do these V8 to the V7 to the V6. Five, four. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I can continue going here. In fact, it makes sense to go on to V3, to V2. Uh, V1 doesn't really make sense. But uh, uh, So this is exactly, if I take hyperplane sections of these, I get del pezzo surface degree 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. So this is entirely parallel to the uh, cascade of projections of the Veronese surface. And these things are quite, quite interesting. So, you know, this guy's P3, and he's embedded in, embedded in P9 as a Fano of index 2. Right? In other words, of course, P3 is a, a Fano of index 4. Right? And it's intrinsically, but I've embedded him by O of 2. So the canonical class, the anti-canonical class of this is twice the hyperplane section. So this is a P, this is a threefold. If I blow up, then the canonical class adds two copies of the exceptional divisor, right? And so if I blow up and then project, this is still a Fano of index two. So all of these varieties of Fano's are index two, right? So this one, this one is, um, uh, you know, three, uh, two intersect two in P. So I've blown down four times in P5. Right? This is the one we're especially interested in. Right? But this guy is also very interesting. So, so, so let's just think about this. What happens is, what happens if I blow up P3 in one point? Right? Then obviously I get something, I get a, a P1 bundle. I just get the standard scroll. P3 viewed as a scroll. P3 blown up in one point viewed as a scroll over P2. Right, what happens if I blow up two points? Well, I blow up one point and then I blow up another point. 
However, I'm embedding by quadrics, quadrics through two points, right? Well, if I've got two points in P3, then I've got a straight line joining them. And if I take quadrics obliged to pass through those two points, then that contracts the curve. So if I blow up, if I, if I, have, these, if I have these two points, so that, you know, I've got this straight line in P3. It's, of course, got a normal bundle O of plus 1 plus O of plus 1. If I blow it up twice, it becomes minus 1 minus 1. It becomes exactly a flopping curve. And so this guy here, so, so this one has a plane sitting in him. Right? And in fact, he's a P1 bundle over P2 where this plane is a negative section. This guy has two planes sitting inside him. But the two planes intersect at a point. Right? And then when I do this the third time, well, I get three planes intersecting at points. Right? But actually, I also get a fourth plane. Because if I have three points in projective space, then there is the plane here. If I take quadrics on them passing through these three points, that is mapping this particular plane to a projective space as the standard quadratic transformation. So there's actually a fourth plane here. Yeah. So this V5 is a... The, the V6 here is... One of these, uh, th this V5 is a co-dimension three Gerenstein variety. It's an intersection of uh, Grassmannian, uh, Grassmannian 2.5, and it contains four planes. So the V4 is this, contains eight planes. The V3 has these, um, you know, singular, however many singular points it is and however many planes. So as you can see, there's the whole of the geometry of the, of the del Pezzo surface is happening here, right? And the last one is especially interesting. This one is a double cover of P3 branched in a quartic surface with 16 nodes. So, you know, if you take six points in V, if I take six points in P3, if I take six points in P3, then uh, in uh, gen general, they lie on the twisted cubic. The six points lying on the twisted cubic. Right? And so there are 15 secants passing through two of these. And then if I blow up those, 16, those six points, then also the twisted cubic becomes a minus one, minus one curve and wants to be contracted to a point. Right? And also, if I've got six points on a twisted cubic, then there's a uniquely defined curve of genus 2, which is the double cover of those. Yes? So the, this the, thing I, the thing I'm saying here is that this construction gives, in a completely cheap and elementary way, the geometry of the, the, the Kummer variety with its 16 nodes and 16 tropes, 16 planes that are tangent to the tro tropes. So, you know, this is a very beautiful construction. Anyway, I want to return to, I want to return to this, uh, to this construction, uh, to this, uh, con so, you know, wh why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Because eventually I want to take this key variety and intersect him with these four hypersurfaces which are invariant in Z mod 2 and I want to force him to contain these points. Right? And so by the time I get to this to this four, so I had I had I had P six divided by Z two. So this was this was P two coned on this Veronese V8, right? So this is sitting inside weight to project space 1, 1, 1, and then 2 to the 10th, right? And so what I want to do is project from four points to this variety, which is P2 
two still coned on V4 now. So this is this intersection of two quadrics in, in this P5, but he's contained in P1112 to the sixth. Right, and he's really in here, he's really F4 intersect G4. Right, so these are the equations of a Godot surface. These are equations of the Z mod 4 couple of a Godot surface. Right, and so the way to see what's happening here is, I'm going over time, I'm sorry. Let, 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 me, let, me, let, let, let me just uh, uh, come, to, come to an end here. <coughs> So if I take four points in P3, general points, so I can assume they're 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. Right, and then I take these uh, S2 of Yi and then vanishing at these four points. Right, and what I get is this matrix here, V1, 1, V1, 2, V1, 3, V1, 4, V2, 3, V2, 2, 2, sorry. And symmetric. Right, and then I say, right, and now I eliminate these variables. Right, these are the guys that are one at these four points. So the thing I'm left with is this, these equations. Right, so all the, all the two by two minus that happened here, I've lost almost all of them. The only equations I'm left with is V12 equals V34. I'm sorry, the, I'm left with two equations, which are V12, V34 equals V13, V24 equals V14, V23. Right, this is a complete intersection of two quadrics. However, the two quadrics are quadrics in these six, in these remaining six variables. So, so I'm getting so, so I, 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 this is the simplest possible toric variety. I'm taking weighted projective space, one, 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 and then these six variables, vi, vij. And here I'm writing down this intersection of two quartics, which is that. So it's just a toric variety. Simplest thing. Sorry, there are two quartics on the board. You're taking two linear combinations. What? This is two equations. This is two quadratic equations in the VIVJ, right? And they're quartic equations if I think of them in, in these quadratic variables, right? And now, so now what about these four quadrics? Well, I want four quadrics invariant under the group action. Just take any four general quadratic equations here, right? And what I get is a Z4, the Z4 cover of a good surface. Right? So, you know, I can, you can mess around a little bit and make this invariant under a bigger group action. Right? And so, in other words, we, if we start from the top, if we start by saying we know the Campadelli variety, then we can make him degenerate to a, to a, a good or like this. And so, uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, so the real point of uh, Sohel's thesis is that he can also do it the other way around. He can take this F4 and say G4, and by being quite clever, he can put a conic on it. Uh, he can put a, a Z4 orbit of conics on this. And he can do it in two different ways to get these two different, uh, these two different uh, surfaces. Anyway, his uh, thesis will be available online shortly.